Okay, welcome everybody. Nice to see you on such a lovely sunny day that you know came to discuss with us the topic of gender and inclusive institutions. And also a very warm welcome to Eugenia Cheng, who's sitting here and you'll see <laughs> in the stage in a couple of minutes, for accepting our invitation uh, to come to ETH to discuss with us how we can make in, uh, institutions more inclusive for women, but also for other historically underrepresented groups. And this is a topic I think ETH is grappling with since a while, but also other institutions in Switzerland, so we are really excited to hear your thoughts on this. Um, Dr. Cheng is a mathematician. She got her PhD in pure mathematics in Cambridge. She's also a pianist. Uh, and currently she is with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, as well as with the City University of London. And she is mostly renowned for her ability to explain complex math, ideas in simple but also very engaging ways. So I just recommend to all of you to watch some YouTube videos if you haven't done that yet to get a bit into math. And she wants to get rid of what she calls math phobia in, in the world. And so she has written books like The Art of Logic, The Joy of Abstraction, and just recently, Is Math Real? Um, but today, we want to discuss um, the book X and Y, A Mathematician's Manifesto for Rethinking Gender. So applying math to create more inclusive societies, and that's a topic that's very much at the heart of the Center for Development and Cooperation, that I co-direct with Fritz Brucker, and my name is Isabel Günther. Um, so I came across the book a couple of years ago, and I'm an economist at ETH, and I've actually written some articles on gender differences globally, and I've read many, many more scientific articles on gender differences. Um, but I hadn't come across something from a mathematician, so I thought, well, you know, I've read a lot from social scientists. I probably get a lot from reading something on the topic from a mathematician, a new perspective that I haven't read before and thought about. And I was not disappointed. Um, so I, you know, read the book. Um, and very early in the book, um, she talks about that we have become a bit fixated on thinking about gender differences and that this sometimes hinders us to really create equal institutions. Um, so me having written about gender inequalities, I get a bit hurt, right? <laughs> you know, social scientists are a bit too focused on uh, these gender differences. Um, but that made me more interested in the book. And also because, as we know over the last 30 years, we have made great progress in reducing gender inequalities in education and health but not really or only very modest advancement when it comes to gender equality in powerful institutions and also with regards to gender inequality on the labor market. And that's also in Switzerland, and that's something that's uh, at the core of her book. Um, so I really recommend you to read the book because it really has is rich with dimensions to rethink gender and also gives hits and tips how to read your institutions. But one of the arguments that really um, stuck with me is that, of course, not all women are all different from men, so that we all know and we probably don't disagree on that, but that there are, on average, in what science has shown, some differences in character types. And then if we ignore these differences in character type, or even worse, confuse gender with character types, we don't get the institutions we actually um, need. And what she also argues is that traditionally institutions value certain types of character traits, and mostly those that have been traditionally associated with men. Um, so this might sound a bit abstract, <laughs> different categories, different dimension. And one concrete example uh, from her book that stick with me is that about, and also something you know, I have heard as a young scientist many times, that men on average ask more often for pay rises, 
And that's why they get paid more in institutions. And then I also got invited for seminars or workshops to learn how to negotiate better, a better pay rise. Um, and so what um, Dr. Cheng argues is, well, we shouldn't say men ask for pay rises and that's why they get more, but that people who ask for pay rises get a higher pay. And then as a next step, we should ask ourselves, do we actually want to have institution where people get paid more because they ask for more? Right? So instead of thinking about this gender and how do we make women fit the institution, rethink the institution. Like rethink within the institutions how, for example, it's just one out of many examples, how we think about pay rises. Um, so, so my reading of the book was really, she invites us to an ungendered thinking, um, not forgetting about gender injustices, but adding this new dimension, right? So adding this new dimension that certain character types are valued more uh, in institutions and that we should rethink this. Um, and she you know, argues that our environment should become more congressive and we'll hear all about what this means. Uh, instead of us tr trying to tweak people to become more ingressive, and we'll also hear what this uh, means. So we discussed uh, your book in our book club, so we have a little book club in our research group, and we had a long discussion which extended the hour that went over lunch, a lot of disagreement, and that's a good sign that this is a really thought-provoking book, so thanks for coming and now discussing this with a, a wider audience. And since the book is really also a lot about how we relate to each other, so not in what category we fall, but like how we relate to each other, we'll not have this as a presentation, but as a dialogue um, today. Uh, and for that, we could again uh, win Marcy, um, who is like the perfect person to ask this, uh, the questions. Uh, she's also a lecturer in uh, gender and cultural studies, and I'm also curious to hear how this kind of changed your thinking about um, gender. So enjoy the discussion. You can also soon join the discussion uh, and you'll hear more about this. Thanks. So hello everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, thank you, Isabel, for the wonderful introduction and for giving me the opportunity to be part of this event once again with the fantastic work that you do at Nadal and the amazing audiences that you attract for your events. Um, it's also my pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Cheng for this uh, dialogue um, in the expanded sense that we're going to have. Um, and I have my own very marked up copy of the book with me here. Just a little note about how we're going to do this. We have time until 6.30, and um, we're going to open up with a little bit of a dialogue between the two of us. And in the spirit of Dr. Cheng's manifesto, we're going to open up uh, to take input relatively soon into the event. We'll tell you a little bit more about how we're going to do that, because it's also a kind of innovative way of um, making the talk less dialogic and more inclusive. Um, before we do that, though, um, we'll take some time to introduce the book, uh, to talk a little bit about um, how you came to write it and um, a little bit about your, your background coming into this subject. And before we do anything else, I would like to um, start with a little note about the terminology that we're using, because um, the subtitle of the book is A Mathematician's Manifesto for Rethinking Gender. That means also moving beyond the binary and um, definitely um, it's a priority for many of us in our work to try to move beyond these binary categories of male and female and speak in a more inclusive way and think in a more inclusive way. For the purposes of discussing the book, we will be resorting to those uh, categories uh, from time to time. But maybe before we do anything else, you'd like to kind of give your own little disclaimer about um, the use of male and female, masculine and feminine in a work which is actually aimed at moving beyond um, that very narrow idea of a gender binary. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you very much for the, in the invitation to be here. It's wonderful to be here. I, and I would like to say, yes, that I use those words in order to criticize them. 
basically, that, uh, that more or less sums it up. Perfect. <laughs> so now that we've gotten that out of the way, we can move on and actually speak. So um, I already mentioned the title. It was mentioned several times, The Mathematician's Manifesto for Rethinking Gender. Uh, gender, as we know, is a social category distinct from biological sex. Uh, and it deals with how society assigns roles to people uh, based on their vision of this distinction, which in the past has often been binary. And um, Isabel mentioned that I teach gender and cultural studies. I come from a kind of art university background and a film and media background. Uh, and most of the gender researchers that I know and that I work with come from the social sciences and the humanities. Um, occasionally, they come from the biological and medical sciences. Um, but you are a mathematician, and your background has given you uh, specific, uh, very particular tools that have allowed you to approach uh, new and more inclusive ways of dealing with difference. So maybe to start, um, you can explain to us a little bit about, as a mathematician, um, your relationship with um, the gender question and with the question of gender difference differences. Thank you. Yes, it could be regarded as a bit surprising that a pure mathematician would write about this. And I was very nervous because I felt that many people from other disciplines would come and attack me and say that I'm not an expert in this, I'm not an expert in that, which is all true. <laughs> so what I'm writing about is from the point of view of my experience of being a woman in an exceedingly male-dominated field, and also using my expertise in abstract mathematics as a way of thinking. Because the maths that I do isn't about numbers and equations and about solving problems. It's about thinking differently about the world and about finding ways to reframe concepts, basically, to gain insight into a wide variety of connected ideas. That is what I think that my research is about. And it is very abstract, which means that it... It is at a level where you can see patterns between things that seem very unrelated. And abstract mathematics seems like it's very far away from real life. But for me, the purpose of that is to see patterns much more broadly. And my experience started because in the earlier part of my career, when I was younger, I didn't want to talk about this at all. Because there are so few women in abstract mathematics and mathematics at large and science and also at high levels in all sorts of society, I was often asked what it was like or what I thought about the gender imbalance in mathematics. And I just didn't want to talk about it. And I think that many women and other underrepresented people have this feeling when they're young because we don't want to draw attention to ourselves and we don't want to give people any more chances to stereotype us and say that we can't do it or look you're causing trouble. I just wanted to keep my head down and prove theorems mm. and in the process of doing that I also tried to hide all signs of what I thought of as femininity. So, for example, I would absolutely never wear a dress when I was in, surrounded by mathematicians. And the first time I wore a dress to a conference dinner, I actually phoned the one other female person at the conference, basically, and we had a whole conversation about it in advance, about whether we were going to do it. So I hid all signs of it. But apart from that, in a way, I was quite used to being looking different because I grew up in England completely surrounded by white people. And so in a way, when I was then the only female person in a room of men, I was kind of used to looking different because I already looked different in some other ways as well. And maybe that helped me in some ways. And I gradually worked my way up through the terrible hierarchy of, of academia. And when I finally became senior enough that I felt stable and I had a stable permanent job at the University of Sheffield in England, I decided I might like to try getting in touch with what I thought of as my femininity. And so I tried doing that, but I didn't know how to do it at work. I just couldn't do it. So I tried doing it outside work. And then I had this weird split life where I felt like outside work, I was behaving in a feminine way. And at work, I wasn't. But and then, sorry if I interrupt, but what would that look like, behaving in a feminine Well, way? I'll come to that in mm -hmm. a moment. And, and so, then, so then I tried to do it at work, 
as well. And I discovered I hated my job. <laughs> and so I quit. So the story is a bit longer than that. But then I started doing much more public work, much more outreach, talking to people beyond math students at math universities. And then I moved back to Chicago, and now I have my portfolio career where I teach maths to art students at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I write books for non-mathematicians, and I do public speaking, and I visit schools, and I talk to children, and I do summer camps in schools, and I talk to teachers, and I write books and columns. And after a few years of that, I thought to myself, well, this makes no sense, my story, because what does it even mean to behave in a feminine way? What does it mean to get in touch with my femininity? That, that doesn't make sense. I identify as a female person, and so everything I do is feminine. And so I sat down and thought about it, and I thought, well, why are we associating character to gender in this way? There was something I was trying to say, but I didn't have the language to say it. And so, like a good abstract mathematician, I thought, well, I'll just invent some words then. And I was also thinking about this because I moved directly from the University of Chicago to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So the University of Chicago is a very prestigious elite, they love to think of themselves as elite anyway, and they are, they're full of students who have all been the greatest student in their class all the way through school. And they get to university, they've been really successful in high school mathematics. And they get to the University of Chicago and they have a kind of sad moment where they discover they're not the best anymore because they can't all be the best when they get there. The School of the Art Institute is full of people who have been completely excluded by mainstream education, who have not been successful in it, they've been thrown out of it, or they've been completely unsuccessful, they've particularly hated mathematics, been put off mathematics all the way through high school. They believe they are the worst person at mathematics. And then they get to my class, and it's quite happy because they discover they can't all be the worst person. <laughs> now, as it happens, Nobody here will probably be surprised that the classes I taught at the University of Chicago were exceedingly male-dominated. I taught honors calculus, and it was possibly 80% male people. And then I moved to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and it is exceedingly non-male-dominated. It is more than 90% non-male people. And I typically, for example, have far more trans students in my class than cis straight white men. So several things happened. One was that I discovered that the cis straight white men still managed to dominate every classroom, despite being in an extreme minority. And I also sat there wondering about those gender differences. Because I know, and I hope that you all know, that it is not a biologically determined difference. Men are not biologically determined to be better at mathematics than women, even though there are still some scientists desperately trying to prove that. And so I thought, what is going on? And I talked to my students about what put them off mathematics in the past. And at the same time, various things were going on in Chicago, including that there, there was some sports team that won some really big sports thing in, in 2016. Some other things were also going on in 2016. But, but the whole of Chicago went completely mad because the Cubs won the thing that they won. I was very, very... I didn't care. In fact, I, I anti-cared. And my students also anti-cared. We were all actually very put out that people were so excited about this sports team beating all the other sports teams. And I sat down and wondered if there was some pattern going on. And that was when I started deciding to, I really, I didn't start deciding, that's when I kind of concluded the decision, did it, and invented some new terminology to try and capture the character traits that I felt were contributing to who was being put off maths in high school, who really got excited about this sports team beating all the other sports teams, and who went into art school and enjoyed what they saw as being a much more creative, open-ended endeavor. Because my students said they were put off maths because it was all about clear right and wrong answers, because they didn't get the right answers, because they were placed 
very low in a hierarchy against people who got higher scores than them and those other people made them feel stupid because there were so many timed tests, whereas they had so much curiosity about the mathematical concepts that they, they couldn't answer all those questions in that time, but they were told that their questions were stupid and that you're supposed to just, just, just answer as many questions as possible and get them all right. And then they were told that they were wrong and then they felt stupid. And so I came up with some words, and the words are ingressive and congressive. And ingressive is to represent going into things. I mean, the etymology is about going into things. But it's also about being an individual, individualistic and being competitive in a zero-sum game where in order to succeed, you have to make sure somebody else fails, that kind of thing. And congressive, etymologically, is to represent bringing things together and taking into account the community and the fact that we're all part of a community. Nobody is really just an individual. In the West, and particularly in the US, there's a big obsession with the idea of self-made billionaires. But nobody's a self-made billionaire unless you're just by yourself in a forest completely off-grid, in which case, where are you getting your billions from anyway? Everyone is part of a community. And so some people refuse to take that into account. And some people always want to take the community into account. And what I reckoned was that, unfortunately, society has been rewarding ingressive behavior for a really long time and also has been associating it with men and encouraging men to be really ingressive. And it has been doing that despite the fact that congressive behavior is better for society and also better for mathematics. Let me jump in and leave a little cliffhanger there for a second, because there's, you've introduced a lot of different ideas, and I'd like to sort of unpack a couple of things, mm -hmm. and also kind of go back a little bit to, your, um, to the, the context in which you started working on these ideas. I mean, we'll definitely spend a lot more time talking about the difference between those two categories and how they also map onto gender. But I'd like to go back to something a little bit anecdotal that you talk about in the book. Um, you put a lot of research into looking at different ways that feminism and gender and gender equality have been framed in different uh, books and literature. And you describe a kind of interesting moment where you go into a bookstore and you come out with two books. One of them is um, called We Should All Be Feminists by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And the other one is called Why I Am Not a Feminist um, by uh, Jess Crispin. And you kind of talk about the, the sort of like the absurdity or the, the kind of interesting idea of having these two people who both um, ultimately want the same thing, which is a more equitable society, but who are choosing such very different paths to get there. And I'd, I'd like to hear you kind of talk about that a little bit more in terms of the path that you've chosen and the goals that you um, had in mind when you started um, trying to invent those, um, kind of reinvent the way that we talk about these things. I do think that we've got ourselves stuck in a bit of a one-dimensional trap. And it's true that I am a higher-dimensional mathematician, so I try to see higher dimensions all the time. But the reason I try to see them is because I think they help us. Because higher dimensions give us more nuance. And if we're all just on some line of either being feminists or not feminists, or, or we believe that there's masculine behavior and feminine behavior, then we end up stuck and we end up having unproductive arguments, I think, where we're being distracted from the main point. And I will admit that when I was young, I declared loudly that I was not a feminist. And so I understand why people do that. And it was partly, I think mainly, in fact, maybe totally, because I was trying to succeed in a male-dominated world and that felt like the best way to do it. I was basically assimilating. But there's a slightly more nuanced reason that it might happen, which is that there are so many different definitions of feminism and you can pick whichever one you want depending on whether you want to say you are a feminist or not a feminist. And so it's, it's sort of like the fact that I declare that I believe in Santa Claus and everyone raises their eyebrows at me. But by my definition of Santa Claus, I clearly believe in Santa Claus because I think Santa Claus is an abstract concept that causes gifts to be given at Christmas. And that concept exists because the gifts get given. And so some people are so determined that, that they don't want to be feminists, that they make a very narrow definition of feminism and then they're not a feminist. Or you can make such a broad definition of it that it would be ludicrous not to be one. And so some people do that, possibly so that 
they can attack all the people who are saying that they're not feminists. And I felt that that may be a, an important discussion, but I didn't feel like it was helping me to achieve anything when I thought about how to make mathematics more inclusive. And I didn't want to just sit around having arguments with people endlessly. I wanted to find a way to do something about it because I really care about the fact that so many people are being put off maths for what I think are really bad reasons. Because they're put, being put off not, not because they don't like it, but because they're shown something that they don't like, and they're shown something that is excluding them. And so I wanted to find a way to talk about that and not get stuck in these conversations about men and women and gender. Then you always have to say, oh, but I'm not all men and not all women, and you erase non-binary people in the process. So just to pick up on that question of moving away from binary oppositions, we've had a couple of them, um, the idea of male and female, art and science, kind of math, logic, and some kind of more intuitive way of looking at the world, billionaires and non-billionaires, there's kind of a bunch of ways that you could break it down. And you've talked in the book about, as a mathematician, you come from a background of a category theory, and you talk about math being more interested in the relations between elements than some kind of intrinsic uh, identity or definition belonging to the individuals. That means, like in a mathematical sense, X and Y derive their meaning from their relationship to each other, and they don't have um, any kind of intrinsic meaning. Um, so that means that when we're talking about um, gender aspects or when we're talking about um, character qualities, um, you're sort of trying to move away from, from a binary or even from a spectrum into something that's more of a, like a field. Yes, and it is important to stress this, that I'm not just replacing one binary with a different mm. binary. And at first sight, it might seem that I'm now trying to divide the world into ingressive people and congressive people, which is not what I'm doing. I'm, it's more of a two-dimensional field, as you said. So you can be a sum of both, and you can be different parts of each at different times. And importantly, it's not a biologically determined principle. There are very few things that are biologically determined, it turns out. But you, it's all learnt. And so because society has been putting pressure on us to do certain things, we end up doing certain things. The brain is is plastic, right? There are a lot of wonderful books of research about the extreme plasticity of the brain. So that if men and women are exhibiting broadly different character types now, that is largely because society has been pushing them in gender different directions for a really long time. It's not because anyone was born that way. And so what I found was that I can now describe my story in a much more sensible way, which is that I had been learning how to be as ingressive as possible in order to be successful in mathematics and in academia. And I got quite good at being ingressive, enough to be quite successful. And then, once I had got to a certain point in my career, I wanted to try and learn how to be more congressive because I looked at myself and realized I didn't like the kind of person I was becoming. And then what happened was when I tried to be more congressive at work, I couldn't find a way to do it, so I quit. And I didn't have that language to talk about it at the time, and so I was much more confused about it at the time, and now I feel I have much greater clarity, and that if I were in that situation now, I think I might be able to find ways to be congressive and still stay in that career. So I'm not saying everyone should quit academia in order to be congressive. I'm saying that maybe if we have this different way to think about it, we can think more clearly about how to make everything more congressive rather than everyone having to become ingressive in order to be successful in the ingressive environment, just like with the example of we shouldn't all have to learn how to, to demand pay rises. There should be some system where, where the institution somehow gives pay rises to people who deserve them without the people having to put themselves forward. Right, so what you're, what you're offering is a sort of a model of liberation for people kind of across across the spectrum. It's not the sense of like there's, you talk in your book about the, the, a brand of feminism like the kind of Sheryl Sandberg lean in version which says everybody should become more aggressive and more success oriented and so on and you know, learn to speak louder and all these kind of things which is um, like a model that's not very satisfying for quite a lot of people people who identify as men may also be tired of the rat race and tired of that kind of individualistic, very competitive way of working. So the model that you're suggesting sort of kind of 
is designed to take the pressure off uh, across the board for people who are looking for that. Yes, and I think it's it's important. One of the things I talk about is that that pressure can go in both directions depending on who people are. So sometimes uh, non-male people get uh, role model events where they're told that in order to be successful, like you say, you have to learn to be more like men. You have to be ambitious and, and confident and put yourself forward and step out of your comfort zone. Change but then, your voice. Right, yes, be one. <laughs> but, but then when we do that, we get criticized for being aggressive or, or being a bully or for being too, too uh, loud or, or something. But then at the same time, there's another, there's another form of supposed progress where men are told that they need to get in touch with their feminine side. And both of these things result in backlash because then some men are so angry that they're being told to get in touch with their feminine side that they think that there's a war on masculinity and then as a result they become toxic, there's toxic masculinity as a reaction against that. And then there are some women who say, but I really like being feminine, I really like wearing a dress or something, but anyone can wear a dress. That's not actually what the point is here, but we're sort of mixing things up. And so it's, this is my attempt to liberate us from that one-dimensional trap. And I'm not saying that we should ignore gender because it's still a big issue. So because there is still direct uh, discrimination on the basis of gender. We can't just ignore it because we have to be able to see it in order to deal with that injustice. What I'm saying is that when it is about character, we should talk about character. When it is about gender, we should talk about gender and we shouldn't mix those things up because that is conflating things that don't need to be conflated and is causing confusion. So we will get back shortly to the question of how to make institutions more inclusive and how to make changes, but I'd like to focus now on something that you said before um, and also how something that we're going to explain to the audience very shortly. Um, you've talked about how this change of category thinking has also affected the way that you teach and the way that you do events like this, um, moving away from the model of you know, getting people to raise their hand and be competitive about getting the microphone. Can you tell us a little bit about how that looks? Yeah, so with this terminology, it gives me a framework for rethinking everything I do, basically. And so I can rethink how I interact with the world and I can absolutely rethink how I teach because now I can think to myself, how can I make my classroom more congressive? But also, how can I make every single maths activity I do more congressive and less ingressive? Because the ingressive model is all about speed, about people who puts their hand up first, who can get the, solve the problem, who can get the right answer. And that puts off people who don't want to be ingressive or who have been, who have been burnt by it in the past. Whereas without this terminology, terminology, you get stuck saying things like, oh, how can I make a maths exercise that is more appealing to girls? Yeah. That's really okay. stupid. And then when that happens, you end up with things like um, pink Lego that is supposed yeah. to appeal to girls. Or I saw one awful example where there was supposed to be a science outreach. There were all these wonderful science outreach things, and there was one for girls, which was how to use chemistry to make makeup. Yeah. And this <laughs> made me want to vomit. Anyway, whereas now I can think, how can I make more congressive environments? And one example is in the way that I do question time at public events. Because in the past, it was the typical, okay, who has a question? And then always the same kinds of people would put their hands up. And uh, you will know exactly what I mean. I don't have to be explicit about it. And there was actually one occasion where there was a queue of people waiting to ask questions. And it was all white men, and then some other white man shouted from the audience, why is it always white men asking questions? So I feel like since I'm quoting somebody else, I can say that. So I tried various different ways to mitigate for this, because of course, to put your hand up and speak up in public is, it's terrifying. I think it's terrifying. And one of the, there are several reasons it's terrifying. One is that for many of us who aren't white men, and possibly for white men as well. You see, this is why you, you, it's good to have different terminology. So for all congressive people, it's possible that in the past at some point, they were told their question was stupid. And because they were congressive, they really took that to heart and were afraid of taking up other people's time. Whereas more ingressive people 
are always convinced their question is fantastic and that everybody needs to hear it. And they may well take several minutes to say what their question is and it might and not it might have, have a question, a question mark. Yes, exactly. And so I tried various things because there's some studies have been done showing that if the first question is from someone who is not a white man, then that helps the balance. So I tried that and all that happened was that the second question was from a white man who was so angry that we had done this that he just shouted at me incoherently and then the organizers took the microphone away from him and he carried on shouting without the microphone. So that didn't really work. So then I tried using an online question system with anonymous submission of questions. And all that happened, I call it the antibiotic resistant superbug phenomenon, where the mildly obnoxious people went away, but the really obnoxious people stayed. Because it was anonymous, they could be even more obnoxious about their questions. So that didn't really work. And so then I came up with, so I thought, okay, so then I thought, what would be really congressive? And so then I came up with a, a way, which we're not quite going to do today, but I'm heading towards what we're going to do, where at the end, if I've given a presentation, instead of taking people's raised hands, uh, oh, and this is because usually what would happen is that after the formal question time, I would do a book signing, and then all these really quiet, congressive people, mostly non-men, would come up to me and and say, I didn't want to ask this in public, but... And then they would ask me a really interesting question. And I thought, well, this is a shame. And so now what I do is I go around the room talking to everyone, just having a little chat, personally, um, face to face, so that the people who are more congressive can dare to ask me a question without them having to say it in public in front of people. It also means that when there are, there's a very wide range of people in the room, including perhaps professors and undergraduates, the undergraduates don't have to be scared about what their professors will think of them. It also means that I can particularly encourage people who look shy or who aren't t typically included in a conversation without standing up and going, oh, you look different from everyone else. Do you have a question? I can just <laughs> encourage them. And it also miraculously means that the people who want to shout at me don't, or at least thus far, there can always be an exception. I'm sure it's not going to be today. But because they're talking to me, to me face to face and the people around them can all hear what they're saying in a human way, somehow it's less conducive to them just yelling incoherently at me. Plus, because the whole room isn't their audience, they don't get to pontificate to everybody, and so for some people, that means that it's just, it, it's not as appealing to them. And so this is an example of, of where I've tried to create a congressive environment so that I'm just not rewarding ingressive behavior anymore. And it means that congressive people aren't at a disadvantage and ingressive people aren't at an advantage. So what we decided to do today, which is what I sometimes do if we're having more of a discussion, is to invite everybody to say what questions they would like in an online thing, which I think we have a slide for how to submit questions. And so it's very important to me that, first of all, the questions can be anonymous and nobody else will see what question you ask. So there are some systems where you can say your question and everyone else can see your question. And then the worst thing is when they can upvote or downvote it. Mm. That's extremely... Well, it's ingressive because you're, it's putting everything on a hierarchy. Very competitive. It's very competitive. And the other thing is that, the other thing is that I am not going to see the questions. And so if anyone feels like they really want to yell at me, I'm just never, never going to see it. So you, they're welcome to do that. Someone else, unfortunately for you, <laughs> will, will see it. And also, we're not going to take the questions in order because... First come, first serve is not a very good way of dealing with questions because who knows whether those were the most interesting questions. And so our wonderful moderator is going to, to as it were, curate the questions. And sometimes several questions will come in that are related that can also then be grouped together. And I hope that this is a more congressive way for everybody to participate in the conversation without being put off and without it being dominated by certain voices. And I think about this a lot in my classroom, because when the classroom is, it's not about squashing somebody, it's about making it possible for everybody to participate, especially people who have previously been really put off participating. And I think that's always an important thing to remember about inclusivity, that we need to be active about it, because some people have been so excluded up until now. 
So thank you so much for introducing these models to us and sharing them with us. I find it very inspiring also for the work that I do as a teacher and a moderator and someone who also does a lot of uh, seminar workshop type of situations. Uh, some of this are things that I was already doing intuitively, but I didn't have you know the, the very precise vocabulary for thinking about it the way that you've um, allowed us to do in bringing up the idea of the ingressive and congressive. So I have the job of being kind of the watchdog and um, filtering the questions. Um, some of them are coming in already, and we'll see how far we get um, in trying to satisfy as many needs as possible. I'd just also like to say if for some reason, because we didn't introduce this, we didn't announce this in advance because we wanted to give Dr. Cheng an opportunity to explain it, and also I think we wanted to surprise people. Um, so if you're not equipped for this because you don't have your device with you or because for some reason you can't type, maybe you can ask the person sitting next to you to submit a question for you if that is helpful. Um, so I will ask you one more thing before we get to what's happening on the screen here, which is, um, oh, one second. I'm, this would be quite distracting. <laughs> if, you, if you ever want to take a few minutes to look at what's going on, I can just say some more things. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Um, <laughs> no, I just... Um, well, never mind. Let's just jump into it. Um, so, okay, so this is kind of an easy question, but it could become more complicated. Someone's asking, in which book do you explain your concept of congressive and ingressive? And of course, it's That's in this, this book. book. But maybe you can, is there anything worth mentioning in this context about the previous books that you've written? Like, for instance, oh, your thank book you. on logic. Yeah, so in the book on logic, that's called The Art of Logic how to make sense in a world that doesn't. I had, I had to think about that because the American subtitle and the English subtitle are different and it's very confusing. Um, and that book came about after the 2016 uh, semester where some other thing happened involving an election. And I, we all got really horrified during that semester about what was going on in American politics and also in the UK because there was Brexit that year. So everything was going terrible. And my students wanted to talk about it all the time because it was so, it, many of them are people who are endangered by right-wing politics, personally endangered, like their lives are in danger. And so if I ask them not to think about it when they come into a maths classroom, they're just not going to listen to me talk. And so I realized, that was when I started realizing that my ways of thinking of abstract mathematics help me to understand political arguments. And I could use that to engage my students with mathematical thinking if I could show them that it does relate to the things that they care about. So that's how that book came about. And I do, I think, talk about zero-sum games in that book and possibly about different voting systems and or maybe the voting systems thing is in X plus Y. I'm a bit confused now about what's in which book. But I talk about zero-sum games. And then in X plus Y, I talk about how so many of the zero-sum games we have in life are completely fabricated, that they don't need to be there. But we have come to a point where we believe that it's important to have winners and losers. And it has become part of almost orthodoxy that competition is good because it, it's in competing that people get better. But people only get better in competition if they like competition. And I really don't. I'm much worse in competition because it makes me stressed. And I think that in my field of mathematics, anyway, we don't compete with each other. We collaborate with each other. And they're, they're, I'm sure there are still many scientific fields where people compete frantically to be the first to do something. And then sometimes what they do is they fabricate their results in order to be the first. And so that's an example of where an ingressive system really does hurt, but I've now completely digressed from what you asked me. That's what did you ask? Because you actually, you've, you've inadvertently um, answered a couple of other questions that were already okay. in the chat, um, including someone had asked a question about how, like, how this uh, dichotomy works in, in science. And you've already answered that by the congressive way of doing science would be sharing oh. more and not being as competitive yes, and, and keeping results secret and, and those kind of yes, things. Yes, and yeah. I think um, it can seem like you need that that you need to be ingressive. It's this common wisdom that things like if you do well in exams, then then you're 
you, you, you're celebrated academically and that's how you get into university, right? But it's ludicrous because exams have nothing to do with research. That I've never met a researcher, maybe there's one now, I'd hate there to be a counterexample, but all the math researchers I know certainly, we all agree that exams are an absolutely terrible predictor of whether someone will be good at research. It's a completely different skill. So we're not filtering for the right thing at all. And so one thing I do with my students is I completely moved away from that form of assessment. And I've learned from art school because in art classes, they don't sit down and have a timed exam. They don't get locked in a room for three hours and they go, now paint a painting. Yeah. What they do is they build a portfolio across the course of the semester and they work on it continuously and they get help continuously and they get feedback and they gradually improve it and then at the end of the semester they have a portfolio. So I do that with maths now as well. They make a portfolio, they do work, they work on it, I help them with it, and I make sure they understand it and make progress. And this is important because everybody, I'm not trying to aim for them all to achieve some particular predestined standard. They all come in at a certain point and all I want them to do is develop and make progress. And with this portfolio method, which is much, which is congressive, it means that I can make sure they make progress. It's not scary. There's no end point. They can develop their work as much as they want, and then they have a portfolio at the end. So there's a lot of quite. Thank you all for your questions. There's so many things coming in here, and we hope we will cover as much as possible. There's a number of questions about the ingressive um, category, including questions like, are ingressive people only annoying and and difficult, or is there something positive that they can also contribute? And also what to do when you're in a department, like for instance, doing your PhD in math, or is there other, people have cited some other examples, um, where everyone around you is ingressive. How do you handle that? We should just say maybe also as a plug for the book that there's an appendix at the back of the book where you give advice. Um, I have it marked here with the orange. Um, how to be more congressive with some role-playing games. I put some, I put some role-playing in because this is what something I find really helps me. That when you're in an ingressive situation and you don't know what to do, it can help if you have role-played some other ones in advance. Because I've been so conditioned to be ingressive, still the first thing that occurs to me is the ingressive response. And so even if it doesn't, it's, a, it's an ongoing experiment. I'm still learning. Life is an ongoing journey of learning, right? And so even if it doesn't go well, what I do is I go home and I think about it more slowly because one of the things that congressive behavior, that sentence didn't go very well. Let me try again. If you're under time pressure, then it's much more obvious to do something ingressive. It can take much more circumspection to come up with something congressive to do instead. And that's one of the reasons I quite really prefer email interactions rather than phone conversations or in-person conversations. There's a common wisdom that says it's much more efficient to talk about something in person. But I have a feeling that comes from the ingressive um, mindset where the ingressive people want to have a phone conversation with me because they're more likely to be able to pressurize me into doing something I don't want to do. Whereas by email, I can take a step back and consider the response and not recognize that they're putting me in a fabricated zero-sum game situation that I don't have to take part in. And so the terminology helps me because I can recognize that I'm feeling an ingressive response coming and I can try not to do that and try and work out what the congressive response is instead. And I think I draw some diagrams in the book where I show that I used to think there were only two possible, broadly speaking, responses. The ingressive one, where you escalate the ingressive situation, but that's the one where, where you kind of have a pithy put down at them. Or there's the passive one where you don't really do anything and then the ingressive situation flourishes. But then I realized the congressive one is where you kind of defuse the, the, the ingressive energy and then you open up a congressive space where everyone can have a more sensible interaction. And May what I I've- read out an example? Just oh, so sure. So someone, let's say the, the annoying comment or the aggressive comment that someone would make would be, oh yeah, what makes you think you're successful? This is a real thing that happened to me. Okay, these are all examples that people have actually said to you, right? So the ingressive answer is, well, I don't have an insecurity complex like you seem to. <laughs> the, pa the passive answer is, I think I'm successful in my own way. And the congressive way is to say, do you think there's only one form of success? That's interesting. I couldn't remember what I said. I started, <laughs> I started trying to imagine 
what I would say. And it was something a bit like that. And so if that's not necessarily the best possible response, because maybe there is no best possible response, but it's just interesting to be able to brainstorm things like that, where I think I would just engage, try and engage about success. And when I do that, what I often find, typically find, is that most people don't want to be ingressive. They've just been conditioned to be like that, mostly as a defense, because they think someone's about to attack them. And if you can reassure everyone that no one's going to attack anyone, then everyone can engage at a much more human and congressive level. Now, it's, so I have... May I just add one more example? Because there's been a number of questions from people about like, what happens if you're the congressive PhD student in a department full of sharks. So just one more example <clears throat> where the reproach would be, you're not very scientific, are you? And the ingressive answer is, said the pot to the kettle, when was your last scientific paper published? Um, the passive answer, the kind of like self-defense is, I'm being perfectly scientific. And the congressive answer is, what particular part of my argument do you disagree with? That was a guy who I was trying to date at the time. <laughs> <laughs> who was a failed scientist in the sense that after four or five very short postdocs, he did not succeed in getting a permanent position and obviously had a huge chip on his shoulder. Obviously, I did not carry on dating him for very long. I said, well, it's actually not obvious. People do carry on dating people like that for ages. Um, or even marrying them. Yeah, yes. So, but the other thing, right, what can you do if you're not in the in a position of power. Uh, it, is, it is difficult. One thing you can do is you can um, ask your library to get my book and then, and then maybe recommend it to someone. But also, you can try and find somebody because ho I hope that there is, will be at least one professor in the department who is sympathetic to those ideas. And then if you can get their help and their support, then maybe you can start something bigger carrying on. And I am really indebted in my career to various congressive, very congressive male professors who supported me in the earlier parts of my career. And they were all male because there weren't any female ones. And they were, they were really nurturing and encouraging. And I didn't even necessarily realize what was going on at the time, but I think they realized, um, without having language to say it, that, that I needed a certain amount of encouragement in order to flourish. And so there are some people who really think that you should be as mean as possible to someone to show what they're really made of. And actually, when I was having my, is this being recorded? It is, do I still want to say this? Uh oh. Yes, okay, I'll say it anyway. Um, when I had my job interview at the University of Sheffield, someone asked me about future plans and things, and I said that I wanted to write a very explanatory textbook on category theory, my research field. And the male professor said, I don't think textbooks should explain things. That's for the, because that leaves nothing for the students to do. It's a very ingressive response. I have now written that book. It's called The Joy of Abstraction. It is very explanatory. Um, but I think that, that I, did have some, I did have some other professors who understood that I was severely undervaluing my own skill as a mathematician. And this is the thing that I think that congressive people tend to see their see their flaws, undervalue themselves, and that's where their self-doubt comes from. But people who are ingressive overvalue themselves, and then they don't take steps to improve. And in maths, what that means is they take giant leaps and say that their, that their result is obvious, and then they don't prove it properly because they think this is obvious, and that's obvious, and that's obvious. Um, here's another story that, is it going to go on record? I guess so. I mean, it's publicly known. So when I was a postdoc, I was very unsure about myself, but I had a professor who basically, he made me apply for a postdoc at the University of Chicago. I would never have done that if he hadn't basically forced me to do it. And oh, maybe I shouldn't be quite so extreme. Well, anyway, he really very vehemently encouraged me to do it. And I never would have done it because I thought I wasn't good enough. But he did, and I got it, and he carried on encouraging me. And while I was there at the same time, there was another postdoc who was an absolute superstar. He had the biggest grant. He uh, uh, wandered into seminars and and asked really, really kind of um, questions that were very scary for the person giving the talk, because it was so, and he, uh, it turned out every single paper he published is now, has now turned out to be wrong. 
every single one of them. He's left mathematics. He's now a politician. <laughs> so you've given me a good key, key word uh, to enter into a certain category of question that we've got a number of. Um, there's been a lot of questions about within the institution, within academia, and maybe we can have some more examples from that as well before we finish. But people are also asking about sort of outside the academy, um, the political system, or the economic system. I mean, the ultimate ingressive situation would be, like, let's say, if one country invades another country. Um, how, how can we continue to spread the good tidings of uh, the congressive mindset in a world where we're surrounded by sometimes really extremely aggressive, even violent um, people? So I will say that if, some, if one country is bombing another country, I'm not, I'm not sure there is a congressive possible response. So I think we have to rescue the country that's uh, being, being invaded. But I will say this, that it can seem hopeless if you think about the most extreme situations that we want to change. Like, I want to change the entire political system. I confess I don't know how it works here. But in, in the US and the UK, where it is basically first past the post, completely winner takes all situation, and that people get, it's extremely ingressive because no one really cares about someone's actual skills in running a country when they're electing them. It's all about the speeches you make and how much charisma you have and things like that that don't really affect running a country. Um, and so if I think about trying to change the whole political system, it seems hopeless because it doesn't seem like we can do that. But the thing is that if we believe we can't change things, then we can't change things. That is definitely a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if we believe we can't, then we won't. So I think what's more important is to start with things we can do and then gradually expand from there. So yes, if you are just a student in an extremely ingressive department, maybe you can't change the department, but maybe you can change some small things around you, like just how you have conversations with your friends, or if you are discussing a problem set with a group of friends you're working with, you can try to nurture a little congressive environment right there where no one puts anyone down for thinking something and where everyone's encouraged to contribute ideas. I always say to my students that every idea is valid no matter what it is because it will help us in some way it, and it will help me to see what everyone is thinking. And so I'd never pose questions in class as, what is this? I, Every question I pose is, what do you think of this? Or what do you think this is? Because then whatever you think is the correct answer. And then everyone's answer is correct. And so I even have changed how I interact with myself. I'm much more congressive in my self talk. I used to berate myself a lot all the time. And that's just a way to be more stressed, basically. But I didn't realize I was doing it at the time. And now I'm much more congressive to myself. And I sort of imagine a dear friend of mine talking to me because they would never talk to me in the way that I used to talk to myself. And then I re realized that I, there is one particular friend I have who is the dedicatee of the book with whom I can always have a very productive conversation because I'm not afraid of what anyone's going to think of me. And so even if you can't change an entire country or university at this point, you can, we can start making small changes. And the small changes will will add up. Of course, if you are in a position of any kind of responsibility over anyone else, then you can make changes at a broader level, whether it's the way your family interacts or your classroom, or if you're at a higher level, the way the institution works, just the way that it values people, the way that it hires and promotes people, and the way that it encourages people who doubt themselves. And those, I do believe that the small changes really add up. And the really important thing is to remember that if we work together, I truly believe that those of us who don't believe in the ingressive systems are in fact the majority. It's just that the people who hold power are really good at pitting us against each other mm. so that they can hold on to their power. And if we can find ways to be congressive with and through our differences, then we can make change by working together. So I have some follow-up questions to that based on the chat, but just really quickly, because I think, just to clarify, to make sure, because I think there's been some confusion, the idea is that the questions were put anonymously onto the platform. 
I'm seeing all the questions and I'm trying to kind of integrate them into our talk, but the questions are not going to appear on the screen. That's the whole idea, was that the questions are anonymous and secret. Um, and some of them are just being kind of answered partly uh, as Dr. Cheng is talking and others I'm trying to kind of add into the discussion. There's very many questions, which is great, but that means that we're not going to do it in the way that I read out one specific question and there's an answer. I'm trying to kind of summarize and, and mix things together. So um, there's a sort of um, cluster of questions that have come through, which fit very well to what you were saying before about cooperating and, and working together. Um, questions about, in particular, on the one hand, um, the fact that women often do, or people who are identified as women, um, end up doing a lot of the care work or work part-time or are not in the same power position. That's sort of one cluster. And then there's also a number of questions about bringing in the question of, um, as you've already referred to a few times, people of color or non-white people and their relationship to systems of power, particularly in the West. Yes, this book was mostly focusing on gender, not because I think it's the only problem. It certainly isn't. The previous book, The Art of Logic, addressed a very much wider range of people who are discriminated against in various ways and systems of power and privilege structures and some mathematical approaches to thinking through privilege structures and visualizing them in ways that remove some of the divisive aspects of those conversations. I do think that if we, if we are able to see what character types we value and value them, then we will become more inclusive to everybody of all genders and all identities in many of the ways that people have been discriminated against in the past. But I will reiterate that it doesn't mean that we should stop seeing that. We shouldn't be race blind or something. We st because people are still being specifically discriminated against for various things, we still have to see that in order to correct those injustices. I just think that this is another dimension that we should think about separately so that we can think more clearly about things. And that's what abstract mathematics is about for me. It's about thinking more clearly so that we think about the things that are relevant when they're relevant and not when they're not. It doesn't mean we forget about them forever. So abstraction is about ignoring certain details in a situation in order to focus on a particular aspect for now. We don't ignore those details forever. We ignore them temporarily in order to focus on something. Just like when you're looking at a map to get somewhere, you don't need every single detail if you're just trying to get somewhere, say, on the train, then you need to know which train to take. You don't need to know how far up and down it goes and which way exactly it goes in the street. So that is to say that we, it just, it, this, the idea is to help us think more clearly about what is the relevant issue in different situations. And because if we, on the other hand, if we don't think about character and we only think about people's identities and the way in which they're discriminated against, then we end up doing diversity without inclusivity. So if we don't make an environment in which people can thrive and we just increase the numbers, first of all, then we're open to accusations of, of reverse discrimination. And secondly, if we don't create an environment in which people can thrive, then we set them up for failure. And then, that, then the people who didn't believe that those, those people could survive get to say, see, I told you. And so I sometimes wonder if people are saying that about me in my previous place of work. See, I told you we shouldn't have employed women. They just, they just quit because they couldn't take it. They leave and go to art school and teach, write best-selling books. Um, so could you maybe provide an example of a contemporary social movement or an organization um, that you consider to have had some success uh, working in a congressive style? As opposed to, you know, militating in an aggressive way. Oh, uh, no, now I feel really on the spot. Could, do, do you have one in mind? Um, is it, was that a, this is a question. It, it was sort of a questions that people were asking, but um, I will say, oh, I, while we're I, on the subject, something that I can maybe contribute, because you were saying that you're more familiar with the um, British and American political systems. Um, I would argue, I don't know if people in the room agree, but the Swiss political system is a little more congressive, um, because Switzerland doesn't have a head of state in the same way, a president or prime minister. It's run by a council of seven ministers, which are culled from the three, four, or five most um, elected parties. So I think the, the idea of um, Switzerland as a kind of, um, uh, what they call like a kind of um, country of discussion and compromise, which often gets criticized 
um, but there isn't that much of like the that one billionaire who's yes, and I think in a way the UK, the although it may not seem like this all the time, has a slightly more congre slightly more congressive system than the US because at least the prime minister has to come through the ranks of elected representatives. Not that that has helped recently particularly. But There's maybe one more aspect here which is also interesting, which is that Switzerland also has a system of direct democracy where four times a year um, all the kind of subjects of the day are put to popular vote. Gosh, that's extraordinary. Yeah. And so if you could think of it as like Brexit four times a year. That's or, not extraordinary. <laughs> which is not a good way, but um, it, it often works out in a more kind of the, the path of, of compromise and, and sometimes the parliament is much more polarized than what the people then actually decide. But just. So here's an organization I've thought of which is mm -hmm. called the Blasian March. I can't, I can't remember if it's called the Blasian March or the Blasian something else. But the idea is that there has been a lot of antagonism between black people and Asian people in the US, where Asian, Asian in the US tends to mean East Asian people, not whereas in the, I don't know what it would mean here, but in the UK it tends to mean some South Asian. And there's antagonism in the US, and this is something that I talk about with my students a lot, and it's in my book, The Art of Logic, because um, black people are very much excluded from society in the US and Asian people are perceived as being privileged because especially East Asians, not other Asians, but especially East Asians have much better outcomes even than white people. So they have higher inco average incomes, higher levels of education. I often get accused of being not counting as a minority, especially in maths, because we're supposedly overrepresented in maths, despite the fact that I have ne I'm the I'm the only person in this room who has not seen an Asian woman speak in public, because I've just never been to an event by an Asian woman because it's always me. Um, I've never seen an Asian woman give a talk at a conference. I've never had an Asian woman professor, but but I still get told I'm overrepresented. And there's a lot of antagonism because uh, racism between different non-white races is very complicated. But Asian people feel that they are neglected in conversations about racism in the US, which maybe they are. It came up during COVID because there was suddenly more anti-Asian racism and attacks because of COVID, but it didn't start with COVID. It's been going on way before that. And there's an, all sorts of terrible history in the US because of that. Anyway, there are, the Blasian March came together to try and unite those voices and have a conversation with all of them together to, to say essentially that while black people and Asian people are having antagonism against each other, the people in power are rubbing their hands in glee and holding onto it and that, that it would be more productive if we find ways to talk about the differences but also still unite against the main force that is oppressing all of us. And I think that they're doing it quite well. Someone in the chat suggested that some of the climate protest movements would be an example of congressive behavior. Yes, and some of them really aren't. And some of them aren't, yeah. Here's a very direct question. Um, do you think a quota system for women would still help to make systems more congressive? I don't think it would help make systems more congressive because all it would do is change the numbers. Whether it would, I don't know if it wouldn't help actually because maybe if more women it's hard to say. Sometimes I think we could just, we should just have women in every position of authority and power in the entire world for the next, say, 500 years <laughs> to make up for the last 500 years. And then we'll get back together again and have a conversation about it. If I, I could quote you to yourself, or this is actually a line in the book that you took from Jessa Crispin's book where she talks about her critique of Lean In is she calls it a fight to allow women to participate equally in the oppression of the powerless and the poor. Yes, that's a good, that's a good quote. But it's from Jessa Crispin, it's not me, it's, yes. But um, you, you found it for us. Yes, I think, I think that, that quotas can help as a sort of desperate measure because all the things that we've been doing so far haven't really got us very far. I recently saw the statistics for undergraduate math students at the University of Cambridge. And uh, I was an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge N years ago, where N is 
a number of decades. And the, the, the numbers just haven't changed, really. I was absolutely appalled. And, and sometimes I think, I don't actually believe they should simply admit 50% women, because I don't actually think that would fix anything. But I think it's an interesting thought experiment. And there's no and, that was it. Okay, well, here's a, a follow-up question on a similar topic. Um, some people have mentioned, there are a number of questions that are specific to the ETH, um, talking about how not congressive it is, and um, one or parts of it. And <clears throat> some, one example here is that um, in terms of the way students are tested and graded, 50% um, of students are designed to fail out at the end of the first year. Um, <clears throat> how do you feel about that kind of... That sounds awful. <laughs> is that because of is that because of um, funding that everybody has to be admitted? I know this happens in some uh, French universities where everyone has to be allowed in by law, and then you have to kind of get rid of them afterwards because otherwise you can't teach them. Is that? No, I think it's part of the ongoing process of selection because it's not everyone who gets in in the first place. But at the end of um, the or, like, there's a kind of beginning level of education, and then people are retested, and only the top get to stay, and the others fail out. I mean, there's a there's a there are difficult questions here about what university education is for, mm -hmm. and I think if we don't have those conversations, we can't really address anything. And that we've got really far away from from what it is for. Is it? It has turned into, I don't know about here, but certainly in the UK and the US, it has turned into a, a stamp of approval that you have to have in order for employers to think that they want to hire you for a job. And it's not about the things that you actually learn, it's about getting that stamp of approval. And so then, in order to make sure the stamp of, the, of approval is worthwhile, you have to select people on the basis of something in the first hand. It's all about putting people in a hierarchy. And it's all about the future hierarchy wanting to get people out of the earlier steps of the hierarchy in order to keep the hierarchy going. Whereas what if we, I know we can't, but it's quite useful sometimes to dream about utopia and see mm -hmm. what it would look like. What if, you know, why, do, why do people who've been really successful at high school exam taking, why do they deserve to go to an, a university considered better? than some other place that has more funding, that has better researchers teaching there. Who deserves to go to different universities? Who deserves to have more education? Isn't it the people who haven't succeeded in the past? Maybe they're the ones who need more education. What if they were the ones who got to go to universities? It's like another, another thought experiment I sometimes do is, is about the fact that Teaching at, being a professor at university is considered so prestigious. It's the highest status part of education. And so people only, it's only considered, people become math teachers at school maybe if they weren't able to. So the higher level you go, then you get to be a teacher at a higher level. And then the people who are teaching maths at primary school are, you know, who would, why would anyone teach maths at primary school if you're good enough to teach it at secondary school, for example? What if we turned that all around and that the highest status was primary school teachers because that's the front line of education. It's the first education that children have. It's the most important. What if you only had to be a professor at university if you were so bad at teaching children that you couldn't get a job teaching children? I think that would be kind of interesting. There is that terrible expression, those who can do, those who can't teach. And then with the follow-up, those who can't teach, teach teaching. Um, we are it's like the professor who said to, in front of me, about me, that being good at teaching just proves you're bad at research. Mm. That's a zero-sum game. Yeah, those are some odd values. So believe, unbelievably, we are almost at the end of time. I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. Um, and sort of putting things together that are in the chat. Um, some people have asked about the effect that your book has already had. Um, do you see changes being implemented or people kind of changing the, the way that they talk about these issues since you've introduced the subject? Thank you. Gratifyingly, a lot of people have told me that it has really changed the way that they think about things and that it has really helped them to change the way they teach. So I, I haven't seen... No politician has written to me and said, oh, I'm going to change the voting system. But at some small levels where, where in situations where individuals can have a direct and immediate effect, like on their classroom, 
people have really told me that it's made a difference. And people of all genders. And so, as you mentioned earlier, there are plenty of male people who have are relieved about it as well because they've never felt comfortable with the pressure to be a certain kind of traditional masculine type person. And often this is particularly true of people in maths and computer science and, yeah. and other parts of science who were never the classic kind of macho, sporty, certainly in America, the, the, the most revered form of male person who's good at sport and, and rides a motorbike or something. I don't know what. But, but, and so all the people, the people in maths who were never that macho football playing type person uh, they're also relieved that they don't that, that they have a way to talk about it and so this can that's why I say that this can be inclusive to everybody of all genders my students have certainly found it to be extremely rewarding as a way for them to rethink everything that happened to them in the education system up to now because I teach these art students who have mostly been really excluded from mainstream education it gives them a way to think about it and make sense of it just like it gave me a way to make sense of the earlier parts of my career so I've certainly seen that happening with people so far so people are also wondering how to connect the things that you've been talking about with the idea of intersectionality, which is also another way of looking at um, social justice and, and equality in terms of not just looking at binaries of gender or a race or other categories, but looking at the way they intersect and join together to um, influence our power positions in society. Have you... Um so I did address that quite specifically in the previous book, The Art of Logic, where I looked at hier the hierarchical structures of privilege and power mm -hmm. in different dimensions and how they interact with each other in a kind of lattice or cube structure that a lot of people have found very helpful. And the thing I would say about that is that, that sometimes I worry that when we focus only on the differences between people, it can be... It can be a race to the bottom in what in the US is sometimes called the oppression Olympics, mm -hmm. that nobody can win if you have to be always trying to find out who is the most oppressed person in the room. And because we're all, we're all more privileged than somebody and less privileged than somebody else. And if we spend all our time trying to place ourselves on that hierarchy, it can get in the way of the thing that we're all trying to do together. Which is not to say that we shouldn't, we definitely must address those different ways in which people have been excluded in different reasons but again if we only focus on those differences then I think that we are serving the status quo because they can hold on to power while everyone jostles for exactly where they are in the rest of the hierarchy and so I would say that the important congressive thing is to always to always try and collaborate and not let the competition between different types of oppression get in the way of our attempt to collaborate with each other. Of course, our attempt to collaborate with each other mustn't overwhelm those other things so much so that then we just end up with more oppression within the collaboration. So it is very tricky, and I don't have the answers. I can't, haven't fixed the whole world yet. But if that's the last question, I'll just try and end on a, on a, on a positive note. Um, because I do, I feel like it has given me so many ways to change the way I do everything in my life. And it's still an ongoing process, and I'm still practicing and learning. But I am so happy that it has already helped some other people to address and rethink things in their life. And because it has already helped me and my students, much as we all love to think we're a unique little snowflake, I don't think I'm that unique, and I think it can help other people as well. And that's why... I wanted to share it. It can look like I am ingressively successful because I write books and I talk to people, but all I want to do is help other people and help the world become a, a better, more inclusive place. And that's why I wrote this book. And that's why I'm so, so urgently desirous of sharing these ideas with as many people as possible because I think it might be able to help you as well. So I hope it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just um, two more things. I'm sorry, we can't take questions in, from the audience. Um, and we're almost out of time, and I have to give Isabel the last word, but just two quick things. Small fact check. Someone corrected me. Um, everyone who applies to uh, ETH who has graduated from gymnasium can get in, so there isn't a selection at the front door. 
And there was a question um, that a couple of people asked, which I feel that I should answer instead of you. And the question was, um, is there anything more to the book than what you already said, or should we also read the book? And um, <laughs> the answer is, you should also read the book and also um, Dr. Cheng's other books, but definitely you should read this book and um, particularly uh, look at the suggestions that she has for how to practice being congressive and talk about how to um, apply these ideas more within your institutions. There's a whole section towards the end about how to make democracy, how to make education, how to make learning, how to make families and relationships um, more uh, congressive. So there is more in there than what we allowed to, are able to talk about in 70, 75 minutes. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. And um, we'll give Isabel the last word of the event. So thanks again for for coming. Um, I got you know really inspired while reading your book, and I got a lot um, out of it. I also have a lot of notes in there. So like my mother shouldn't see this book. She thinks one shouldn't write into books, but <laughs> I got many I ideas. So I really encourage you also to to read the books. We couldn't discuss everything here, and also the book give, gives a lot of graphs, kind of to you know if you're more kind of the graphical person, kind of to understand the like concepts behind it, um, it, you know, it's a it's a really great book. So I also got inspired now listening to you, and I hope uh, you did as well. Um, I'm not a big fan of takeaway messages um, because you know we now discussed and listened for 75 minutes. Um, so you know I wouldn't try to summarize this in two sentences. So that you can do for yourselves. What are the uh, main messages? But I think you know what we should get out of this by adding another dimension. Maybe we can see more clearly through some of the gender issues we are uh, facing. Or if you're just confused, but on a higher level, more dimensional level, that's also fine. That gives you more to, to think about and, um, and discuss. Um, so, you know, just reminding everybody, we have this series of rethinking different topics. So we started with rethinking capitalism. Uh, two years ago, and uh, last year we were th had this um, conversation on rethinking human nature, and today rethinking gender and all that for more inclusive societies. That doesn't make it easier, but we think we have to think about these uh, different um, dimensions. And we hope that we see you again next year. We don't know yet what topic we will rethink, um, but hope to see you there. And then very important also at ETH, is that after any event, we'll have an apero uh, where you can discuss more, where you can ask more uh, questions. Dr. Cheng will be, be a bit around. So see you outside um, in a minute. And I have a small thank you for the two of you with Ooh. Zurich treats. Yeah. Uh, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you so much. Thank I feel you. like I live in Zurich. I deserve it, but thank you. So you got the ones to eat, so, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so thanks again. Big applause again. And see you outside.